So first of all, thanks everyone for uh, for coming here. It's uh, it's really nice to uh, to be here. I actually live in uh, I'm Israeli, but I uh, currently live in Mountain View, California. And uh, I had the opportunity to come here. I was uh, I was actually speaking at a couple of talks last week at Strata in London, so it was a good opportunity to come uh, visit the family over the weekend. Um, the downside being that they're in Haifa, and I had to drive like it ended up being like three and a half hours this morning. I forgot about how bad the traffic is. Uh, so anyway, this uh, this talk is about data exploration and analysis uh, in a world of non-relational data stores. So uh, when I talk about non-relational data stores, I mean things like MongoDB, Elasticsearch, HBase, Hadoop, Cassandra, S3, all these places that we're now putting data in um, that are not really not necessarily relational databases. Um, so I'm the co-founder CEO at a company called Dremio. I have my email up here and I'll have it on the last slide too. Actually, it's on the bottom as well. So if you want to reach out, feel free to uh, shoot me an email. So just one slide about uh, Dremio and then we'll get into uh, the, uh, the kind of meat of the, the talk. Uh, so we're still in stealth. There's not much information online about it, but uh, basically founded in 2015, backed by two of the uh, uh, top VCs in Silicon Valley, Sand Hill Road. Um, and led by experts in big data and open source. So I was a VP of product at a company called MapR before this, joined there very early. Uh, my co-founder Jacques Nadeau is the creator of Apache Drill and more recently Apache Arrow. Um, and Julian Ledem joined us as an architect from Twitter where he built Twitter's data pipeline. He's also the creator of Apache Parquet, which is the columnar format that most people use if, if you're using Hadoop or something like that. Parquet is kind of the standard there. Um, and will soon be the standard on for file formats on Amazon. Okay, so the the crux of this is basically, you know, if you think about the the good old days when we had a very simple world, right? We had a few relational databases and we had a few BI tools and everything worked with everything, right? These were systems like MicroStrategy, Cognos, and so forth on the BI side. Then we had Oracle, SQL Server, uh, you know, MySQL, Postgres, so just a few relational databases. And that was really easy, the data wasn't too big, it was very well structured, and I could connect, just take the BI tools, connect them directly, right? That was, that was kind of what things uh, look like. And in fact, I was talking to the CIO of uh, Comcast, which is the, the, the biggest cable company or media company in the, in the US, and she was telling me that they actually have over 10,000 instances of Oracle running in the company. So what does the world look like today? It, uh, is, it's a lot more complex. So in terms of where our data is stored, it's stored in systems like uh, MongoDB and Elasticsearch and S3, HBase, Cassandra, Solar, uh, things like that. And then from an analysis standpoint, we have tools, of course, like Tableau, Click, Power BI, Excel on the BI side, but we also have a bunch of other tools that we use if we're more sophisticated or more technical uh, kind of data science users, right? Things like uh, Datto and Python and R and SAS and all those types of tools. And the problem here is, uh, I mean, there, there are a bunch of problems, but at a high level, these tools can't really connect or work well with these new, this new generation of databases, right, or data stores. So systems like MongoDB, the schema is in the application, right? There's no schema, but the developer just decides what fields they want to put and when, right? If you look at Elastic, there's full text search. When we talk about Hadoop and S3, Google Cloud Storage, Azure Blob Storage, et cetera. Um, those are all file systems. They're actually files and not tables, right? And so we have this big, messy world with a lot of heterogeneous data. And in many cases, what we're actually seeing now is people replacing relational databases with a combination of non-relational databases. So one of the Fortune 100 companies actually in, in the Bay Area in California uh, is replacing uh, an Oracle database with a combination of MongoDB and Elasticsearch for their entire uh, order system. And the company makes over $40 billion a year. So this is a significant deployment and there's a lot of reasons they're doing that. Uh, but now they have two systems where that data kind of has to be emerged in order to understand what's going on. So let's start with an example for some uh, motivation. So let's say we have these two databases. One is MongoDB, the other one is Elasticsearch, right? And this is a data set, we're gonna use a data set from Yelp. That, uh, that's made available online, which you can download. And in this case, we have a bunch of data related to businesses. So these are hotels and restaurants and things like that, uh, primarily in the, in the United States. And then we have user reviews. So these are people writing reviews and giving a review in terms of a number of, a rating in terms of number of stars, one through five, to, to these businesses. So as an example on the left, you have a business here, and this is a, uh, one location of McDonald's, 
its uh, average rating is, is a 2.0, so not very good. Um, and there's a business ID, and then there's an array of categories. So it's a uh, fast food, it's a restaurant, it has burgers. I actually simplified this record uh, quite a bit. It's, it's actually a lot bigger. And, and then on the review side, we have the review ID, a link to the business ID. Um, we have various votes, what that specific review is in terms of num number of stars. And then we actually have a text, which is what the person wrote about the, the review. So there's all sorts of interesting things you can find when you look at this data set. And there's millions, millions of these uh, records. So let's look at a few example questions. So what are, the, what are the highest rated cities with at least 100 businesses? And so if we were using a relational database, this would actually be a really simple thing to answer. In this case, the, the top, four, um, top four cities with, uh, that, are, that have highest rated businesses uh, are these four. So number two is Scottsdale, and these are all in, in Arizona. And so to get just this simple question answered, which is like a five line in a relational database is a five line SQL query, uh, we actually have to write 66 lines of Mongo, MongoDB query language, right? And something similar if we were using Elastic. So certainly not something that, a, that you know, somebody who's not into MongoDB, not a hardcore kind of developer would even be interested in kind of learning and doing, right? Another example, what are the most common business categories with at least 20 businesses? Actually, the answer here was, was pretty interesting. So the, uh, the most uh, highly rated business categories, the first is event photography. So you know, you're getting married, so you're happy, and so you give it a high rating no matter what happens, as long as they don't lose the photos, right? Uh, and then number four here was really interesting. I thought I'm coming to Israel. Uh, you know, everybody here would be like, why do boot camps, boot camp is tionut in Hebrew, why do those get such high reviews? And so the answer is this is not like the, the boot camp uh, uh, you know, military boot camp, this is what people go to, to, to exercise and there's these classes that people do um, that are kind of hardcore. A little bit like CrossFit, if, if, if you, you do CrossFit like I do, but something similar to that. And so you're happy you're getting into shape and so you, you're, I guess you're happy that people are yelling at, yelling at you and making you do push-ups. Uh, but what did that require? So in that case, just this simple query that had, had to look at the group by on the, the values in that array requires 89 lines of Mongo query language. So it's pretty crazy that you'd have to write all of this by hand just to get that simple answer, right? Um, and then if we wanted to do an analysis across multiple data sources, so let's say we wanted to look at what businesses have the most user reviews containing the word bugs. So remember, the, the reviews are in Elasticsearch, the names of the businesses are in MongoDB, doing that join, of course, is something that we just can't do, right? This is where we'd have to you know, bring out, I don't know, Eclipse or something like that and start writing, writing code, writing a Java application or Python. So we need a better solution than that, right? That, that's just, uh, you know, I, I, what's really happening here is that in many ways, it's become a great world to be an application developer in, right? Building an app is easy. I download one of these open source databases or use these cloud services, and they're great. They have good APIs, they scale very well, and I can build my app in no time. If I'm an analyst or a data scientist that needs to take advantage of that data, it's, uh, it's like we've gone back 15 years in time. And so the first step to solving this problem really is to uh, make, it, make it easy for these systems to, um, to, to share data in an effective way and, and then to build on top of that a system that allows us to analyze data across multiple data sources. And so I'll start by something we actually announced uh, back in February called Apache Arrow. And this is a project that, uh, that we started at uh, Dremio, but basically uh, very quickly has kind of turned into the industry standard way for uh, representing columnar data in memory. And so we're now uh, uh, working very closely with uh, Cloudera, uh, Intel, Hortonworks, MapR, Databricks, Datastax, and a bunch of other companies. It's, it's now going to become the standard way to represent data in memory in R, uh, Python, so the creator of Pandas in Python is, um, is contributing a lot of code here. Uh, he's actually at Cloudera right now, um, and most recently Julia. So, um, so a lot of support from the, from the community, from the industry, a lot of committers on this project, but at a high level, the goal here is to enable us to store and analyze data in memory in a columnar format as opposed to a row-oriented row format, and so we can get speed-ups of 10 to 100x in terms of CPU uh, utilization. Uh, the second thing here is by having this standard way to represent memory, uh, data in memory, across all these different systems, from you know, Spark to Drill to um, to, to Python, right, to Pandas, uh, we can then move data between systems without any overhead, right? So imagine writing your SQL query or your Spark application and then using a Python UDF and not having to pay any performance penalty, right? That's really what we're, uh, 
what we're getting here. Um, and so all these different open source projects are now on board and working towards integration with Apache Arrow. The first advantage of Arrow is CPU efficiency. So traditionally, if you think of this uh, data set here at the top where you have a session ID, a timestamp, and a source IP. So traditionally, in, in every, uh, basically every system today, um, or almost every system, that data is represented uh, in kind of a row-oriented format. So the memory buffer looks like the one on the left. So we have the first session ID, then the first timestamp, then the, the first source IP, and so forth. Um, what we're instead doing is we're allowing the system to hold all of the session IDs first, then all of the timestamps, and then all of the source uh, IP addresses, right? And what this allows is it allows the CPU to take advantage of SIMD operations. So more recent Intel CPUs are able to process more than one piece of data at the same time. SIMD is basically uh, same instruction, multiple data. So if we can organize the data so that we can operate on basically a vector of values instead of a single value, then the CPU can, CPU can do all of them at the same time. And so this allows us to basically speed up performance dramatically by allowing much better parallelism and cache locality also insert inside of the CPU. The second advantage here is that this is a shared format, uh, shared memory format between all these different systems. And so we have things uh, like Parquet and Cassandra and Kudu and HBase kind of storing data, and then we have all these processing engines, Spark, Pandas, Drill, Impala, right? And today, th the integration between all these systems is based on kind of simple API calls, which is really inefficient, right? It basically means that we're deserializing and serializing data back and forth all the time, and 70 to 80% of the processing time is spent just on that kind of serializing and deserializing. The other downside is that if you look at, for example, parsing uh, Parquet files today, there are actually four different implementations out there of Parquet, right? One of them is in the Parquet project, one of them is in Apache Drill, one of them is in Impala, um, I think Spark has its own. Uh, so we're actually bringing all of those back together into having a single canonical way to uh, process these formats into this memory representation, and all the systems will then consume that memory representation. And so with Arrow, we have basically a much simpler, you can see it's a lot simpler on the right, um, uh, way of integrating systems because they all share the same memory and so all the RPCs and all the IPCs can use that uh, canonical memory format. And that's the advantage of doing this as kind of an open source project that all these different companies or technologies can, can collaborate on and agree on. And so let's look at what, what this actually looks like in terms of Arrow's columnar in-memory representation. So how do we represent complex data in an efficient columnar format? If you think of the data in MongoDB and Elasticsearch, we're talking about nested data that has maps and it has arrays, and sometimes we have multiple records that have different fields. And so I actually once thought that most people that use Mongo still kind of had the data pretty clean, right? The, the name is, is always the same data type. Well, it turns out as we started getting a lot of data in kind of the early days of Dremio from uh, kind of our prospects or potential beta customers, uh, you know, they would send us their, their data, and I'd say probably 90% of the time, the, the data was just not clean. It was not, like, relational, right? The name column had multiple different data types, and sometimes it was just an empty map instead of null or things like that. Um, so in this example, we have two records. We have uh, two people. One is Dave and one is Joe. They have an IQ, and then they have a few addresses, and the addresses is an array, okay? So if we want to represent the IQs of these people in a columnar format, that's really simple. We just need two, uh, one buffer, each let's say is four bytes, and so we have an eight byte uh, vector, and it has two values. Well, it gets more complex if we want to represent, let's say, the, the number inside of the address, right? What you see highlighted in yellow here. Because now there can be a variable number of elements in each of these arrays. And so what we have to do here is we have to introduce another, we basically introduce an array that's, uh, that has all the offsets. And so in this case, we uh, basically, that array points to the start of each of the, the records, right? So two and three belong to the first record, four, five, six belong to the second record. And so we have those basically pointers in the first array. And what that lets us do is then uh, maintain data in a columnar format, um, even though we have these arrays inside of, the, inside of the data, right? So we can still keep all of the, uh, the numbers in a columnar kind of organized way. Um, now, if we have things like strings, that's no different. Strings are essentially like arrays, right? They're variable length. And so we basically introduce another array of indirection, right? An array of pointers. And in this case, that helps us understand 
the length of the, the string. So in this case, the first string is one, one letter, one character, and the second one is two characters. Third one is three, and then four, and then one, right? So we have that uh, array of pointers in the middle, which is basically the representing the length of the, the strings. So again, we're able to keep all of the data uh, for these streets in a single columnar representation. So that gives us the ability to get much higher compression, much better CPU cache locality, and CPU utilization. So then we get into the situations where we have, like I said, a, a single field that has multiple types. So we sometimes call this mixed types or the union type. But basically what's happening here is unlike a relational database, we have, say, a name. And that name in the first example here is a string. And in the sec second example, it's a map, which has a first and a last. So the way we represent this in a columnar format, we actually have an array of data types. So that's the first one. So basically that first array has the data type for each of the, uh, each of the values. So the first, one is a, the first name is a string, the second name is a map, then the name is an integer, then it's a null, then it's a map, right? So we do it like that. And then for each of these data types, the integers, the maps, the, the strings, the varkars, um, we then have its own representation just like we saw in the previous examples. Okay, so that, again, we're able to accomplish the same thing, which is to keep the, uh, the data in columnar format in memory, even though the data was really complex, it had arrays, it had maps, um, and it also had different data types in different records, right? And this is really the most complex model. This is what you have if you're using like JSON files, you know, gzip JSON or, or MongoDB or things like that. So the way we use this, uh, you know, if you look at how Arrow is used both in, in RPC as well as IPC or inner process communication. So this is one example where we're looking at a, the execution of a single query. And what's happening here is we have a bunch of Parquet files on the left-hand side. And the Parquet scanner, or the, the, the reader of Parquet files, is then converting that into arrow uh, format in memory. And from that point on, all the work inside of the system is using arrow. And so this is what we're moving Apache Drill to, is to, to a model where everything is internally arrow. Um, and so we do the partial aggregation. That first partial aggregation basically um, is aggregating what's available on that node. And then it's actually doing a shuffle. And then the second phase of aggregation happens. Um, and then we bring the results back to the user. And even the user is getting the results back in Arrow uh, into the, the tool of their choice. So let's say they're using Pandas and Python. That comes back in Arrow to Python. And we have no overhead between going from the distributed system all the way into a data frame in Python. Another example here is I'm running a query or a job in Drill or Spark. And so I'm using the SQL engine, running a first SQL operator. And then let's say there's a user-defined function in Python in this case. And so what happens is these two processes can share the same uh, piece of memory using uh, shared memory. And basically the Python process then receives that piece of memory that came out of the first SQL operator. It can actually process that data in an efficient way. That result goes back into the first system, again, through shared memory on the, on the box. And then the results keep, keep going from there. The, the execution graph keeps going. And so we get zero, uh, basically zero overhead communication between processes here uh, by sharing the same memory. We don't have to deserialize and serialize data just to go between different formats. So if you've ever tried to use Python, let's say in Spark today, so Spark has a Scala API, it has a Java API, and has a Python API. So the Python API is like orders of magnitude slower than, than any of the other ones, right? So the goal here is to solve those types of things, right? And allow us to, to use that in, a, in an efficient way. So what's next? So this is the first, the first step which we, uh, which we announced and we're working on uh, along with a bunch of other companies, you know, Cloudera and so forth in the, in the community. Uh, the second step here is to build an execution from, from Dremio's standpoint, at least, is to build an execution engine that allows us to use uh, Arrow uh, internally but to be able to analyze data across all these different data sources. So Mongo, Elastic, Hadoop, S3, and so forth. So I want to show you a, just a, a short demo. And I'll try to make it a live demo. We'll see depending on whether the internet works or not. But if not, I have a, I've learned my lessons from many conferences. And I have a recorded video as well. So, um, so if it doesn't work, we'll do that. So how many people here use Tableau or have used Tableau? OK, so fair number. Um, other common BI tools that people use? 
Splunk, okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect to the uh, we're going to connect to a cluster. So I have a, a small. It's it's twelve servers running on AWS. Um, it's running on the West Coast, so I think Oregon. So latency is a little bit high here. So once I connect using uh, using Tableau, and this could be a Python application, anything that uses ODBC or JDBC, right? So it could be uh, any any SQL based application essentially. So I've connected to the cluster here. And what I can then see here, if I look at the schemas, is I can see all my different data sources. And so this is all coming through the, the cluster, through the system that's, that's executing distributed execution with Arrow. Um, and I see here I have uh, my Elasticsearch databases. I also have uh, my MongoDB database here called Yelp. Um, and then I have a bunch of other kind of workspaces that I've created. So let's start with a simple example, um, MongoDB here. And so I have a bunch of users and a bunch of businesses. This is the data set of users inside of Mongo. So I'm going to drag that here. And you can see I didn't have to define any schema. This is just a Mongo database. Uh, developers have been using that for you know, building their, their application. In this case, we've, we've just loaded a bunch of data from Yelp, all the, all the Yelp users into that system. And you can see that I can, tr I can now treat that data from MongoDB just like it's a uh, relational database. So for example, I can drag the Yelping since uh, field and I can see when people join the Yelp service. Right? I can drag the number of records. And I can see how many people joined Yelp uh, each month. And as I'm doing this, uh, these queries, Tableau is sending the cluster the SQL query. The SQL query then gets translated. Whatever can be translated into Mongo's query language gets translated. Whatever can't be translated happens inside of the distributed execution engine. So um, you know, Mongo has some capabilities. It, can't do joins. It can't do some various types of you know. It can't do casting of types, uh, but it does have some aggregation support and some basic things. So we take advantage of that where that's possible. So in this case, you can see that as expected, as Yelp started as a as a company, you know, 2004, more and more users signed up to the service, um, and then not so good in recent month that has actually gone down. Now this isn't their whole data set, so I, I don't know that there really is a decline in user registrations. They they only make some of the data available, but it is what's in the sample data set. Um, and I can use the full functionality here, right? I can I can create table calculations and say, okay, I want to look at the percent difference between month and month. So now I'm looking at how many, what's the percent difference in new user registrations from one month to another? And so I can see in the beginning it was actually accelerating, so it's all green. It's actually grow. The new user registrations are growing from month to month, and in recent months I can see that that's actually declining, right? So I'm able to analyze data inside of MongoDB just like I analyze data inside of say Oracle or SQL Server or something like that. So let's look at a more interesting uh, or more complex example. So I'm going to remove this here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually um, show you how I can also use just SQL statements. So inside of this um, elastic.yelp, I, I have data here in the reviews. Um, and that data has a field called text. So I can also use uh, just a custom SQL statement here. I'm trying to make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So I can do something like select star from elastic dot yelp dot review. And then we have this function here called contains. And contains some, some relational database have a function called contains for free text search. And we're using that here as well. And so I can do contains text bugs. So basically I'm looking for um, all of the reviews that have the word bugs in them. And this is going to get pushed down into Elasticsearch, so it's going to actually effectively do a search in Elastic on all these millions of records looking for the word bugs. Okay? And I can actually use the full Lucene syntax here. So that basically creates a table inside of, or not a table, but uh, a reference inside of Tableau here. So I can name that uh, review bugs, let's say. And let's join that now with a data set from uh, MongoDB. So I'm going to join that with the businesses in Mongo. And the reason I'm doing that is because I actually don't have any like uh, business names or anything that would be useful here. This is just a business ID. Th this field here is just the uh, business ID. So I'm going to join that with the business data set inside of Mongo. And so that's going to help me get the actual business names or the city or, or whatever I want to actually analyze on. So I, I'm going to correct the join key here. All 
Okay, and now, we can do an, now I can do an analysis here and I can look at, for example, um, I can look at the names of the businesses. So what's happening here as I'm dragging, each drag here is basically doing a search on Elasticsearch, uh, getting data from Mongo, the table from Mongo, and doing a, an, a join in memory of those two things and returning the results to Tableau. So Tableau is sending the SQL query to our cluster, which then does that. Um, so here I'm seeing all the names of the businesses that have at least one review with the word bugs, right? Because it's an inner join. Um, I can now look at, uh, okay, number of, let's say number of records. So I can has the most reviews with the word bugs in them. So you can see it's pretty fast, it's a distributed cluster. And so I can see that the Riviera Hotel and Casino has the most reviews with the word bugs, right? And so I don't know if anyone's, anyone's planning a trip to, we're out of time? Okay, if, you're, if you are planning a trip to Vegas, this is, uh, um, just, just think twice in terms of what, uh, what hotel to, to book at. So uh, hopefully that gives you a sense of the kind of things we're, uh, we're, we're doing here. Um, and we are out of time, so feel free to uh, come, up to, come up to me later or, or ask questions or send me an email. Thank you. Thank you.